welcome to the My Journey podcast presented by me, Matt Johnson. We're now on the final episode of this batch of interviews, but I've already got more lined up. So far, we've heard from Drew Povey, Alex Deakin, Jim Connolly and Nick Rotherham, Guy Smith, and today, Rosie Millard. If you've not heard the others, I thoroughly recommend you go back and have a listen to them. As ever, it would be great to hear from you as I prepare for the next batch of interviews. Let me know what you do and don't like about the pod and who else you'd like me to speak to in the future. Back to this episode though, and we're going to hear about Rosie Millard's journey to chairing some of the UK's largest arts organisations. Talking about her setbacks, challenges and the lessons she has learnt along the way, in this interview we get a real insight into the world of arts journalism. There are some fascinating stories and invaluable tips for anyone wanting to get to where Rosie is, and some more general career tips too. As ever, please pass this podcast on to friends and family, leave a review and subscribe. You might not realise but it does make a real difference. So, once again, thanks for listening. Here is the My Journey podcast with Rosie Millard. Today, I'm joined by CEO of Children in the Arts, Chair of the BBC Children in Need, former Chair of Hull City of Culture 2017 and Trustee of Opera North. Rosie Millard, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good, good. So, we're going to start at the very beginning here. So, education and school life, how was that for you growing up? Very happy. I went to a girls' day school in Wimbledon where I grew up. Um, I went to, uh, apart from a year, where I, uh, my parents took me to live in a former mission hospital um, in South Africa. Apart from that, I spent my entire education in one school from the age of five to the age of 18. Um, it was a very academic school, and um, and I and I really enjoyed it. I did loads of of acting, of debating. Um, my parents are both doctors; they both work for the health service, but they are also arts nuts. So my mother would typically, I'm one of four children, we'd all go off to museums, and galleries, and, and theatres, and we were one of those weird families who never had a television. So uh, that was a bit embarrassing. So I learned actually through not having a television I learned how to pick up what people were talking about and run with it as if I knew what was going on because it's so important at school to to be uh, au fait with what I mean nowadays it would be snapchat but in those days it was it was sort of Grange Hill um, and very important to be uh, knowledgeable about what what people were talking about otherwise you felt left out. And from an early age were you interested in arts and culture was that something you were thought might be something you go into as you grow up? I always loved the arts. Um, as I say, my parents uh, were doctors and they're now retired and my two sisters are nurses and my brother's a GP. So the whole family is medical and I am not. Um, I always absolutely, I can remember the first exhibition I ever went to see. This will show how old I am because it was the famous, iconic Tutankhamun exhibition at the British Museum, which has the 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 honour of being the the biggest exhibition ever. It, this it can never be surpassed because of health and safety regulations nowadays. But I think upward of a million people went to see the 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 treasures of the Tutankhamun tomb at the British Museum, and I remember queuing up for hours and hours and hours. I was about I was about five years old, six years old, and then being issued into the the chamber with a great death mask was glowing, you know, all gold and black in this kind of like dark room. It was absolutely amazing and I love the drama of it and the special nature of it and the the special quality of art, which meant that this was a moment, this was a unique moment and one that couldn't be replicated anywhere else in the world. And I was standing and I never forget that sense of privilege standing there looking at this uh, beautiful and rare object yeah you can imagine like from the way you speak about how impressionable that is yeah I, well i've remembered it all my life yeah, yeah. and equally you know i went to, I, I, you, if you grow up in london if you're a child in london you're very very lucky because a lot of stuff is free of charge and a lot of stuff is, isn't too expensive. It becomes expensive when you come into London if you have to travel in and make a pilgrimage to see it, um, which is why 
I'm an absolute advocate and always have been of arts going outside the capital so that everyone can have a share of it. Because it's not enough just to say, well, this gallery is free or that theatre performance is, is subsidised. Because if you've got to come in from Hull or Manchester or Bristol, it then starts to get very expensive. And you went on to study at Hull University doing English and drama. I did. What was the plan there? Did you see a career path ahead of you or was it just out of pure enjoyment of the subjects? Well, I applied to do drama at Hull. Um, you know, Hull has always had a fantastic drama department with a great um, sort, of, sort of standing and, and, and my friend Jane said, oh, let's apply to Hull. So, I mean, in those days, you, you didn't really sort of scope your universities in with such forensic kind of detail as young people do now. And we'd heard that Hull was really, really good. And we thought, yay, let's go there. And she ended up going to New York and going to art school. And she still lives in New York. She's a dear friend of mine now. She's still there as an artist. And and um, I went, to, I had a gap year and went off to high school in America. I didn't really think about where I was going to university because it seemed so far off and distant when you're at school. And I ended up in Hull. And... You know, I just thought, this place is extraordinary. This is like nothing I've ever experienced. You know, I came from suburban London. Here I was in Hull in the middle of the 80s. And Hull was a city which was still reeling from the impact of both its industries collapsing almost overnight. The deep sea trawling industry and the port. Um, one was nobbled by the Icelandic Cod Wars and the other by the arrival of container vessels. Um, so, so you saw a city which was, you know, pretty hard up, and, uh, uh, but determined. And that sounds like a cliche. That is why cliches happen, because, because there's an element of truth inside them. And, you know, there was still a, a kind of wit about Hull, even though it was, it was dark. Uh, the place was, was, was dark and there wasn't much going on, but there was a kind of wit and a verve and a sensibility that you could, you could make it um, because you sort of had to. And I remember the extraordinary geography of the place. I used to drive out with a friend of mine who did drama, who's, who's now producing Les Mis, um, and uh, he works for Cameron Mackintosh. And we used to drive out in, in his car and go out over the flat, flat East Riding kind of plain and go to places like Paul and Spurn Head and uh, uh, Spurn Point and, and, and just... You know, have that experience that Larkin, Philip Larkin, writes about of where sky meets land, and they almost kind of, they almost you can't tell the difference almost because the whole thing is so flat and so watery. Oh my goodness! I mean, our houses were so damp in Hull. I mean, I love the university and I love living here, but my goodness, we had damp houses and biblical quality quantities of slugs. Oh, we had so many slugs. A friend of mine had jumping slugs. They appeared on the top of his oven. I, mean, I don't know quite how, but... I've never heard of jumping slugs before, but... <laughs> there are a lot of slugs in Hull. <laughs> yes. Um, so, in terms of your inspirations through that period, you say, like, about the Tutankhamun exhibition, was there anything else that really stuck out as a um, focal point within your early years that you thought, that's made an impression on me and has changed, like, maybe the course or the direction you were going? Well, I think probably my mother taking me to see uh, shows, taking me to see exhibitions, um, impressing upon me the, the, the joy and the, the, the great kind of experience of, of live performance and, and, and live art and the special nature of it. And then when I got to Hull... Um, you know, Hull was a long way away from London or lots of my friends were from Stoke, they were from uh, Liverpool, uh, they were from Sheffield and, you know, there were no direct trains anywhere. I mean, we travelled by coach um, or hitchhiking and, I mean, there were trains but we never sort of seemed to go on them. Um, and therefore, when you turned up in Hull at the beginning of term, there was no question of going home to have your washing done. Uh, and there was no question, really, of your parents. I mean, my parents came up once or twice. But you were here and you kind of had to make a go of it. And that was quite good. And um, 
and the drama department was small and it was engaged and it was uh, it was a sort of can-do place and if you wanted to put on a show we used to have these shows called huddles which were Hull University Drama Department Lunchtime Entertainment. That's what the acronym stands for. And we'd put on anything, you know, in, in, in the lunchtime and everyone would go and see it and everyone would support each other and there was a great camaraderie. And, and then there were big, big productions we put on. Um, there was a connection with the German department. We put on a, a, a German opera, which was amazing. Um, I, pay, I played a, a troll in, a, in, a, in, a, in this German opera, which was hilarious. I think I was in a body stocking. Um, and, um, and, and I helped um, the wonderful uh, head of the history of art department, John Benesconi. I helped him um, put... Uh, well, I won't say curate. I mean, he curated the art exhibitions, but I helped him hang them. And I understood how an art exhibition hung, uh, was hung, and the decisions made, and and the the whole kind of point of of thinking about how an exhibition can be experienced by a uh, by by a visitor. And so when I went up to the Edinburgh Festival with uh, a, a somewhat doomed production because no one came to see it we all hitchhiked up to edinburgh and lived in a in a hideous sort of one bedroom flat in leith and we had to walk into edinburgh every day carrying the set and we lived off industrial sized tins of cling peaches i mean it was just absolute misery and i sort of realized there that was in the the um, halfway through my my university career that actually I really did love drama and acting and I love the theatre, but actually what I really liked being was a sort of magpie in all art forms, opera, you know, art, exhibitions, drama, literature, because I was reading English and drama. And, and I think that what my experience in Hull, because it was so varied, because I did all these different things, I did costume design, I made loads of costumes for a, a, um, a restoration farce that we put on. And, um, you know, throughout all of it, I sort of thought, well, what I like doing is everything. And, and therefore I thought, well, perhaps arts journalism because also my parents as well as being weirdos and not having a television they were madly keen on print journalism and we used to have two newspapers a day every day and I grew up loving newspapers and when I was in when I was at Hull the independent was launched and I and I would have the independent delivered every day to my door I mean I still believe the sort of it's a mark of a civilised person, isn't it, to have your, your newspaper and a lucky person to, to be able to live in a place where they have deliveries. I'm sure, you know, if you live in the countryside, perhaps that's not possible. Anyway, I've always, I could never bear to live in the countryside, so I've always managed to have a newspaper delivered every day. And I love newspapers and I love sort of arts, uh, criticism and journalism. So I thought, well, maybe um, actually what, what, what the huge variety of culture and art that I've experienced at the university has given me is a, is a taste for everything. And maybe arts journalism is going to be the way forward. And I didn't really even know if arts journalism was a thing. Um, but I went to the um, careers department. The careers department at Hull University is very, very good because Hull University is not a Russell Group university. It doesn't have a huge amount of people who have a sense of entitlement. It doesn't have a sense of entitlement itself. It doesn't have a sort of like, if you come here, you'll be made, my, my lad, and the world will be yours. It has a sense, a different sense, and a very much more important sense, I think, of saying, we are a springboard, and we will encourage you to make the best of yourself, and it's up to you to do it. And... You know, one meets in life, one doesn't, one, people who sort of, you know, who always hark back to their university days as if that's the only sort of thing they've achieved. And, I, and I'm very, very proud, don't get me wrong, I am very proud of going to Hull University, but I do regard it as a catalyst, um, which enabled me to become, well, to have a very interesting and varied career afterwards. And the careers department, also I think because it, it, Hull is in a place, or was certainly then, 
in a place of, of, of intense unemployment, the careers department really meant it, you know, and it looked with active um, interest at what things were available. And they said, right, well, you need to uh, get a showreel together and you need to go and train to be a journalist and you need to train to... And I thought I'd like to be a radio or television journalist. As, 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 although I loved print, I was sort of quite keen on the sort of bit of drama in me, sort of likes the idea of broadcasting. So they said, go and do a showreel, go and put some stuff together. And I went down to Radio Humberside and, and met a lovely journalist called Liz Meach who really helped me, helped me put my showreel together. And then I applied for variety of places including the BBC and to be an arts journalist and um, and I got an interview at the BBC on their journalism training course I thought it's fantastic great so I trooped down to the BBC clutching all my you know CV and and tape and all this sort of stuff and they said um, so you want to be an arts journalist I said yeah, yeah yeah and they said do you listen to arts programmes on the radio? And I said, oh, absolutely, I love them, I love arts programmes. Of course, I'd never listened to one. <laughs> and they said, what's the Radio 4 arts programme called? And I just said, I can't remember. <laughs> and honestly, if I have any tip for anyone, it is do not make things up, either at interview or on your CV, because you'll be caught out and it's so embarrassing. I said, I can't remember. And they said... Uh, do you mean Kaleidoscope, which was the predecessor of Front Row? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, tip of my tongue, tip of my tongue, you know. Um, so that was embarrassing. Um, and then I ended up going to, I didn't, funnily enough, I didn't get asked to, to, to join the BBC at that juncture. Um, but I, I went to the London College of Printing, um, which is now called the London College of Communications, which was a, and is a great place. It's uh, part of the University of the Arts in London. And um, your first gig, they gave you a, a recording device and said, right, go out and go out into the street and, and, and report on the traffic. And I was so terrified. I, and I was sort of weeping in the loo and just couldn't cope with it. But it was, it was a baptism of fire. You had to go out and interview everyone and every, everything um, for a year. And it was very good because it taught me how to spot a story and what a story is. And that as a sort of knack in that. Grounded and then, you in them basics. Well, yeah, you end, you end up sort of, you know, you go to dinner parties and you meet people. And if someone says to you, I work at Lever Brothers, I mean, you have to be nosy. And you say, oh, I work at Unilever. You say, well, what do you do? And this actually happened to me. And, and this man said well, I work in the deodorant testing department. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, 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 we, have, we test deodorant. And so we have our men, we get men volunteers, and we roll one armpit with links, and we roll one armpit with, or spray one armpit with a control. And then we get the men to go out and eat a curry or play badminton or have a scary moment or something where they sweat. <laughs> and then they come in the next day, and a woman, because women have got better sense of smell, stands underneath the man, the man puts his arm up and the woman puts her nose right into the armpit and she has a, she's in a white coat and everything, she's got a sort of tick, you know, she's got a sort of file and ticks or crosses or writes down the sort of whether the smell B.O. can be smelled. Wow. And I just thought, that, do you know, I actually got a job on, on, on the basis of that story because I sold that story to the independent, the much missed independent on Saturday magazine, which was... A, known, a glossy magazine known for its brilliant photography and it was a double page spread hardly any words the photograph of a woman in a white coat with a row of men with na half naked men all with their arms above their heads with her nose right in this armpit and I actually got offered a job um, working on a, a television program because it was such a great story I didn't take the job up because what that job was come 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 and um, find brilliant stories for our presenters to do and I was like no 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 I want to find brilliant stories for myself to do but finding a story is well that's is a sort of knack and I was taught that knack at the London College of Printing. And how did you find that change when you did move into the world of work from studying and having been at school university yeah. and the college into a, a job how did you find that? Well I, very, I was very grateful um, for very tough tutors at the London College of Printing. You know, if you were late, they just gave you a massive bollocking and, you know, and if you didn't turn up with the interview, they also gave you a what for. So therefore, you learned quite quickly 
that you cannot go away without getting the stuff. It is not good enough just to say, oh, sorry, you know. I was interviewing, when I was at the BBC as arts correspondent, about 10 years after I was at the LCP, I interviewed the former Prime Minister, Edward Heath, uh, about music, because he was a great musician and conductor and so on. And um, I was interviewing him. I was going, oh, and this was years ago. This is in the days of reel-to-reel, kind of like cassettes. And I was interviewing him. I was going, oh, Sir Edward this, Sir Edward that. And it was for the PM programme on Radio 4 that day. And I looked down and I saw to my horror that the wheels weren't going round. I hadn't turned the machine on. And I just thought, I can't leave the room without getting the, the, the stuff. I cannot. And so I just said, Sir Edward, could you just summarise the entire argument in one sentence, please? And he clearly thought I was an absolute amateur, and he, but he delivered it, and I got it. And that's what that taught me. And, um, yeah, and, and the, the other lessons I learned were to, you know, just, just cope with disappointment and um, be able to... Pick, pick yourself up and, and move on. And again, that sounds like another old saw, but, you know, it's true. And and just to sort of get on with it. I suppose within journalism, you're going to have times where it hits and times where it doesn't. And that must have been quite a grounding when you made them mistakes and then you're going into college and people are telling you that you've made a mistake. I suppose nowadays there is an argument that people are too lightly tread and... Uh, padded and looked after too much within them arenas and it sounds like your training really set you up for the real world as yeah. it was um, so you've done time as both print journalism and broadcasting how do you find it different trying to source stories for both of them or is it a similar approach well uh, broadcast news um, both are very interesting um, I think that Print news is slightly more nuanced. You can, you can, you can say more, I think, in eight hundred words than you can in three minutes of 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 broadcast news and pictures. Of course, what you lack in the print is the pictures. So you let the pictures obviously tell the story. Um, in a way, broadcast news is more um, contrived because you have all to you know you have to set up everything the lights and everything and then you just have to do several takes or well you don't have to but invariably you end up doing several takes and there's a certain amount of rehearsal whereas with print you can just pitch up with your pencil and or oh, if you've got a very good memory nothing um, and you can just sit quietly and chat to people and they relax and tell you all sorts of stuff and um, I, I used to have a gig doing um, celebrity interviews for the Radio Times, and that was the most hilarious thing because people would think, oh, the soppy old Radio Times, I'll relax. And then they tell you all sorts of stuff, which they didn't really mean to, which, which um, I remember I was interviewing some, uh, one of the contestants for Bake Off who actually came out and said he was gay and hadn't actually... Con- not that it was a confession, but he hadn't indeed said this in print before, so that made a bit of a stir. Because they've sort of relaxed and they think, oh, the Radio Times is just cosy and nice. Um, and, uh, and then they, they reveal um, more than, than perhaps they want to. I mean, the, 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 the object of... of not all journalism, but most much of journalism is to get revelation, is to lull people into a sense of security and to make them feel secure, um, although not comfortable, um, and to 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 enable them to reveal something. Um, and you know, being charming, and polite is half of it. Also, listening is a key thing for interviewing. You have got to listen to what people are saying rather than just worrying about what the next question is. And I've seemed to have found in the past that a camera makes people feel very intimidated. So I suppose when you're doing print, people are more relaxed because the camera's not... So in much their face. more, yeah, yeah. And radio allows people to be relaxed as well because you can forget about the microphone. Of course, that is why reality shows are so clever because people do, after three days, they do forget about the camera and then they can be quite rev- revelatory. Yeah, and how does radio sit within that between the um, broadcast TV and the print 
is there a noticeable difference there as well? Well, I think radio and, and by extension podcasts are, are you know, very powerful because they're very intimate. It's one person speaking and you, the listener, listening. And there's nothing much in between the, you and them. And if you're listening to headphones, their voice is very close to you. And, and so I think it, 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 is, it is very direct and it can be very, very powerful. And we can all think of radio broadcasts that one has heard, which you'll never forget because they're so direct and moving. And throughout your career, obviously, you've changed where you've worked and moved up through the, the ladder and things like that. How important is networking for that and finding people and making them connections with them, not just for an interview, but in the wider world as well? Well, um, it, I think on a rule of thumb, it's quite a good idea not to fall out with people or behave like a complete charlatan because... Um, yeah, these worlds are small and someone who you're incredibly rude to on the way up, you're bound to meet at some point or other in your career. Having said that, it's very important to stand your ground. And um, I remember I, I, uh, after I finished my training, I went to my first job was at Tyne Tees in Newcastle on an arts show. And that was just great and really fun. And then I went to work on a, on a global arts programme, which collapsed and we were all sacked on Christmas Eve, I remember. It was really grim. And that was in London. And then I sat down and I applied for a zillion jobs, including a job at the flagship BBC arts programme, Omnibus. And I thought, that is, my, that is my goal, that is my destiny. And I'm going to apply for this job. And I got down to the final you know, three people um, and and I was being interviewed and uh, and I, I was quite a contrary person and I think that's because I went to Hull University. I mean, I really think it is. It's it, it, Hull gives you a sense of kind of slight arsiness, which is very, very handy as a journalist. And, you know, you do end up questioning everything and you end up being slightly anti-establishment um, for obvious reasons because, you know, you've lived in Hull for three years and... And when Hull itself is in its nature anti-establishment, you know, let us not forget the civil war began outside the gates of Hull. And it sounds like an old thing, but it actually it is true about the spirit of the city. So I had a sense of arsiness, which possibly was always latent in me, but was brought out by being in Hull. And so when the editor of Omnibus said to me, what do you think of David Hockney? And I just thought, well, I'll just say he's overrated, he's rubbish, you know, come on. And I basically got stuck up a tree with David Hockney and couldn't get down again. Because they kind of looked at me and they said, what, what? And I thought, oh, Christ. So anyway, I didn't get that job. And um, I, I went to, I did do one piece for Kaleidoscope, the, 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 the programme I uh, omitted to listen to throughout my entire university career. And um, I, I then went and worked for This Morning, um, which then was hosted by Richard and Judy in the Liverpool dock. You know, there was a floating map of the UK and so on and so forth. And uh, R&J, as we called them, uh, hosted this daytime show. And I, having had a deep, complete sense of entitlement, thinking I'm off to run omnibus, suddenly found myself working on daytime television. And that actually was brilliant, because in any mo given morning, you would have to deal with... 12 models in hot pants, uh, a child genius piano player, Neil Sadaka, who's an old crooner, who's very sweet and charming for listeners who don't quite know who he is, and someone with a terminal disease, and so, a, a politician. So you'd have to cope with all this stuff and you'd have to prepare all these people, write their brief, which became a very good experience in writing because I'd have to knock out uh, a thousand words on Roy Hattersley or somebody. And, and also cope with an enormous array. I mean, these programs are very, very hungry. And uh, you'd have to cope with a huge array of ideas filtering past your desk any given day. However, I still wanted to be an arts journalist. That was my calling. And I think that it's quite good to have a kind of aim of not where you want to be in 20 years' time, because that's bonkers, but where you want to be in five years' time, I think it's quite handy. And I wanted to be working on an arts show. So I, um, I did some scoping around in Liverpool where I was living. 
And I found a whole bunch of kind of weird events and exciting arts events, which to my knowledge weren't being covered. And my experience of arts journalism in, at, at this point was the programme I'd worked on in Tyne Tees, the global arts programme which had collapsed, and one piece on Kaleidoscope. So I found this exhibition, which was all to do with tights and hosiery, and it was like sculptures made out of hosiery in the Blue Coat Gallery in Liverpool. So I thought, well, oh, this is great, I'll propose this to Kaleidoscope. So I wrote to Kaleidoscope and I said, Dear Kaleidoscope, I'm very keen, I've done a piece for you already, and da da da, and I, that, that was in Derry, London Derry, and I now I want to do another piece from outside London, this is a thing on tights, etc. And I got a very nice letter back from the editor saying, really sorry, this doesn't quite fit our bill, you know, sorry. So, okay, fine. And um, every morning, as we now know, I get a newspaper delivered, and every day I would look and see what was on the running order for Kaleidoscope, because it's useful to see, you know what's coming, don't you? Yeah. And, uh, and I opened it uh, literally about two weeks later and I saw you know, exhibition with tights and sculptures from the Blue Coat Gallery at Liverpool. And I just, I'd never forget, I will never forget that feeling. I was 23 years old and I thought, how dare you? How dare you? You know, I'm really young and inexperienced, but I know a decent story and you lied to me. So I was absolutely furious. So I, I was infuriated. So I wrote to the editor and I said, how dare you steal my story? I'm a young journalist. I'm just starting out. I sent this to you in good faith. You responded, you said you didn't want it. Now I see it's in your running order. Uh, yours sincerely. And, you know, that was quite a daring move because I was so young and he was very well established. But I was righteous. I had righteous indignation. And he did me a massive favour because... Um, from then on, I then couldn't stop seeing millions of stories all around me of hilarious and engaging arts things, kind of art in washing machines and art on the top of mountains and people dancing naked in discos and, you know, all sorts of... Um, um, uh, uh, people weaving m moon webs in, and dancing around them in, in the middle of the Lake District. I mean, just sort of mad stuff. I thought, right, I'm going to pitch these to newspapers. And I've never, ever written for a newspaper before, but I was so... I was so um, I was so determined to prove this person wrong, and that kind of feeling of injustice is quite a good spur, actually. So I'd hide away in the cloakroom at this morning on a on a on a landline, you know, on a phone actually connected to a wall, uh, and say and, and get through to the independent newspaper and say, oh, "Hi, I've got a great story for you." Blah blah blah. And I'd uh, my first boss, you asked me what was useful in my first jobs, and the first one was. Do not say you can't deliver, okay? And the second one, which I, with my first boss, he would refuse to have meetings. He never had meetings. He was allergic to meetings. He'd say, follow me, old thing. And I'd, and I'd run after him and I'd say, oh my, and I, I was a researcher for a local arts program in, in Newcastle and Tyneside. And I'd have to pitch him the stories while running behind him. So I got very, very good at, co at collapsing my story into one sentence. Go, oh, Mike, there's a great guy. He go, and they, and they go, he go, no, boring. And they go, oh, marvellous. And then we'd rush off and do it. And it was very, very good training because then, you know, a year or two later, I was doing exactly the same thing, hiding in the, in the, in the cloakroom, pitching to the indie, saying blah, blah. And they commissioned it because they didn't have time or energy or money frankly, to send a hack up from London to, to the Lake District to see people dancing and naked in the disco. But if they want to send... If some crazy woman from near Liverpool is willing to drive up there, you know, and, and do a piece, then why not? And, you know, I was very grateful. They gave me a big chance. And then I built up my portfolio, slowly but surely, um, until about two... For about two years, working on this morning, and then doing hackery and freelancing at night and at weekends. And the first really big piece I did was on the M62 because I was in Liverpool, which is at one end of the M62, and I knew Hull, which is at the other end of the M62. And the M62, listeners, is one of the only motorways that doesn't go through London. It just ignores London, and yet it takes in the entire population, the size of the population of Australia. 
fun fact. Um, so, so, so at weekends, I'd drive along the M62 interviewing crazy people who lived, like there's a, there's a farmer who has a farm in the middle. I, I have been in that farm. Wow. I have sat and had a cup of tea in that farm while tr- trucks go thundering past, literally about two centimetres away from the window. It is hilarious. It is a sight to behold. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's classic. Anyway, so, so I did all that. And then after a while, I thought, right, and I'm going to, and I left. And I jumped off into the freelance world to make my way, as it were, um, with 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 a, with a clutch of newspaper articles under my belt. And you spent a lot of time in journalism. Is there any pieces or moments that stand out to you as a career highlight? <laughs> the look on your face says that's quite a tough question. Oh, that is hard. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, I mean. <sighs> Being interviewed about the city of culture is a lifetime high, but in terms of journalism, um, actually, the piece I loved doing most of all, just loved, loved doing it, was the opening of Tate Modern. And because this was a story that I had covered, I was by this stage, I was the arts correspondent at the BBC, and I arrived at the BBC in a fantastically interesting time. You know, I finally got there. And uh, that was in 1994. And so I arrived at the sort of arrival of the YBAs and all that incredible excitement with sort of Damien Hurst and, 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 you know, the Turner Prize and all that kind of real excitement and the, and the lottery. And so suddenly you had real money going to the arts because the arts was very brilliantly by Virginia Bottomley, now Chancellor of Hull University. She was at that point... Secretary of State for Culture, and she insisted that one of the good causes be the arts for the lottery, which, if you think about, yeah, the, the, the slightly difficult arena the arts has in government circles is quite surprising. Anyway, there it was, and therefore lots of money was going for new build capital projects, one of which was Tate Modern. And I covered the arrival of Tate Modern from blueprints to hard hat, uh, you know, building site, to gradual kind of like gathering up of excitement, of excitement, to the opening day. And I will never forget, I was standing on the mezzanine level. I'd been there since six o'clock in the morning doing breakfast news, you know, one o'clock news, six o'clock news on television. But the, but the actual moment I was covering it was on Five Live. And I was up there with my headphones on and my little microphone. And I looked down at the, at the big, big turbine hall and the whole of the arts establishment were lining the hall on a walkway. Everyone, you know, Gilbert and George, Vivian Westwood, Andrew Lloyd Webber, I mean, just every... Well, I don't know if it's Andrew Lloyd Webber, but yeah, <laughs> anyone you can care to imagine or think about was there. And Nick Sirota, the then director of Tate and architect, not actual architect, but architect in a metaphorical sense of the arrival of Tate Modern, just said... In five minutes' time, the Queen will be here to open this building. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. This is a great journey. This is a great moment for British culture. He said some words to that extent. And I just, I was just so excited. I knew I was seeing something momentous. And I said to him afterwards, what is going to be, what, has, what will be the moment of the day for you and he said, it will be tomorrow morning when the doors open and members of the public can come in free of charge into this wonderful building. And, you know, he's a, he's a, I'm not alone in saying that I admire Nick Sirota, um, but he is a true public servant. And also he's somebody who has never, ever uh, let his standards slip and he has never delivered substandard culture to people um, and uh, he is remarkable he is truly remarkable and Tate Modern became the most successful if you measure success by footfall um, collection of modern and contemporary art ever in the world it is the, 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 the most successful gallery holding those things and the collection itself is ostensibly the same as was in the old Tate 
they just took away the, 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 they left the British work for Tate Britain and took away the 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 the, the foreign work as it were um, and, and 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 the modern work modern pieces um, both English and and uh, British and not British and put them in, in Tate Britain Tate Modern so ostensibly it's the same work that everyone always saw but in a different uh, platform. And that is a very, very interesting point. Um, and I think, you know, one can see it, one saw it here in Hull at the Ferens collection, the wonderful Ferens Art Gallery, um, which was totally revamped for the City of Culture. And and the, the, uh, the gallery had an updo, but essentially the collection remained the same. And suddenly we're seeing the place absolutely packed with people because it was presented to them in a different way. And it was presented to them in a way which encouraged them to come and see it and said, this is not a scary place. And this is not a place which is not for you. This place is for you and come and see it. So on that topic of Hull 2017, how does an opportunity like that come along for yourself? Was that through the right circles or did you see it and think, I need to be a part of that? Okay, <laughs> well, it it was it, it was an enormous stroke of luck. Um, however, it was perfect because um, after I left Hull University and worked in journalism, I became a champion of the city, a self self acclaimed champion of the city. As I said, my, one of my first articles was about the M62 and the Humber Bridge, which I celebrated and saluted in that article. I interviewed the bridge master and went into the bridge and up on the bridge and all that kind of stuff. I started the piece with the bridge because the bridge is wonderful. And since then, I just went on and on and on about Hull. And when I got to the BBC, I was the only correspondent in the whole home news team, of which there were about 30 correspondents, who hadn't been to one of two universities, and I think we know which ones those are. I was the only one, okay? And so people would say, where did you go to university, Rosie? And I got used to saying the word Hull twice, because I'd say, Hull, they go, where? And I go, Hull. And they go, ooh. And, and, and I thought, right, you know. So therefore, if anything came up with Hull in it, you know, such as the English patient, uh, nominated for five, uh, eight Oscars and won seven of them, I would say on the news, former Hull University lecturer Anthony Mingella is up for eight Oscars. And the editor would say, did you go to Hull University? I'd say, yes, I did. So I championed the city very actively on national, in a national sense, A. And B, I was very familiar by the stage that the, the, the came around for the bid I was very familiar with the with the notion of how culture can change a place, either successfully or unsuccessfully, because there have been disasters of people, well, you know, good thinking people giving a sculpture to a housing estate and hoping that there suddenly everyone's going to have their lives turned around and it just doesn't work like that. So it's a very well known story in the art in arts journalism. It's one I had covered a lot. So I knew sort of where the skeletons were. I'd covered Liverpool, capital of culture. I'd covered, I'd covered Lille, capital of culture. You know, I understood the, the notion of the capital of culture and I suppose by extension, the cities of culture. But what really swung it for me was, um, I think Alan Johnson must have been away or uh, busy. But um, when in 2013, when the announcements of the cities of culture were made, the City of Culture 2017 was made. Um, ITV Breakfast Show ran me up and said, can you come in and and, and and pitch for Hull? We've got people pitching for all the other cities. Can you come and do Hull? I said, oh, I'll be there right now. Of course I'll come, absolutely. So the next morning I turned up and there was me sitting on the chair and Lorraine Kelly, who was advocating Dundee, and Ruth Madoc, who was advocating Swansea, and somebody else, who I can't remember, who was advocating Leicester. Richard II, the third, hadn't turned up then in the, in the, in the car park, so, you know, there we have it. And, um, and we each had to say why our city should be the rightful winner. 
And I had just been back to Hull for a drama department reunion and I'd, I was training for some marathon or whatever and I'd, I'd done a run, a training run along the prong and I thought how beautiful it was and the Humber was sparkling and golden and the Humber Bridge looked like a little toy and it, the, the whole prom was just beautifully done and redone and beautifully paved and with fish sculptures everywhere and it just looked fantastic. And so I said this, I said, Hull is an amazing, extraordinary and wonderful place and deserves to win. And everyone else I was like yeah yeah and then and then they said we now go live to parliament to to college green where the secretary of state maria miller is with the chair of the advisory committee phil redmond to say the city of culture 2017 they didn't really say it in an american accent but it was like that and then phil gave maria miller the envelope and she she undid the envelope and she just said the 2017 city of culture is hull and I tell you, they then cut, the, the, people will remember this, they then shot, they cut to the whole truck where people were, they just, they all jumped up as one body and just went, ah! and the people were crying. Oh, it was amazing. I was dancing around the, the, the television studio, I was punching the air, just saying, this is great. And honestly, the faces of the others, they were such sad losers. God, they were sour. Oh, and the next day, then I went home and I just thought, this is quite right, this is perfect because Hull was the obvious winner and the only winner and the proper winner. And, uh, and I got back to the house, it was about nine o'clock in the morning and the Telegraph rang up and said, can you write a piece about why Hull is the obvious winner? And I said, <laughs> yes. And so I sat down, I wrote, basically 2,000 words in about 20 minutes. And I just said, this is why, this is why, this is the city of Marvell, this is the city of Wilberforce, this is, this is the city of Larkin, this is the city of the Humber Bridge, this is the white phone boxes, this is, uh, you know, just yeah, everything but the girl, this is a wonderful place, and extraordinary geography, and the wonderful people, it's a great love, whole truck, ferrets, all, all, all. And I wrote this piece, and, uh, and the piece, and this is in some quite sort of early days of, of, of social media. It was shared a billion times, but not a billion, but a lot by people in Hull. And that, and then, and then, and I think, we, I, to be honest, I think that was my job application. Um, because then, uh, then I sort of, yeah, I was really pleased for Hull, but I then sort of forgot about it. And then a headhunter ran me up about four months later and said, do you want to go for the job of chair? And I'd never chaired anything ever. And I thought, oh, no, this is, this is not, this is beyond me. I mean, even with my ambition and sort of like you know, <laughs> um, optimism. But um, anyway, I prepared for it and I did really, really prepare for the interview. I mean, I, I, it was like taking an A-level. Uh, I really worked hard uh, for the interview so that I could breeze in and make it look easy, which is another tip. <laughs> Um, so so it was it was lucky, but I had I had the perfect conditions because no one has ever said to me, um, "We think you're making it up," uh, or "You don't deserve it," or "You're not from Hull." What the hell are you doing here? No one has ever said that. They may think it, but they've never ever said it to me because you know I have integrity in my position as a supporter of the city brilliant um, I know you have to head off uh, oh, shortly God. so um, just as a, a slight focus for maybe people that listen to this if they, if they were wanting to get into a career in journalism what do you think the focus should be for them like how is the industry going to change over the next few years there's been okay. quite a lot of locals shutting down right like that. The, the industry I'll tell you what the change is like the change is like when Gutenberg invented moving type, okay, or printing, the printing press. That is, that is what is happening. And I, as a 50-something hack, uh, I have been writing on vellum and quill pen, and then suddenly the printing press arrives. It is that monumental, the shift to, to, and to online and, and with the arrival of the internet. And people don't quite understand how to use it yet don't quite don't quite understand how, how it should be monetized i think that newspapers are sort of getting there but aren't quite there yet i don't think i still love a newspaper and actually holding one but i will still you know this today have i actually read a newspaper no i haven't but i've read two already online so 
there we go. Um, because I got up, left the house too early before the paper was delivered. Um, so it is monumental, the shift. But the thirst for news and information and opinion it hasn't gone, you know. If newspapers, I don't. Th- I think newspapers may shrink. The few, the offer might shrink, but I don't think they're going to go away because people like opinion, and comment, and analysis. And you know, a newspaper doesn't deliver news anymore because that's pointless because you've got instant news everywhere. So newspapers need to do something else, and that is personality and in-depth analysis and those sort of things. And and they reign. I think they still stand pretty firmly on that basis. Um, I think if you want to be a journalist and it sounds like kind of such a simple thing to say but so many people fail to do it read the newspapers watch the news listen to radio listen to the output for goodness sake I cannot tell you how many times I speak to journalism students and I say who has read a newspaper this morning and nobody puts their hands up you know, come on, guys, and don't just read the Metro or some free giveaway or listen to, I don't know, some tiny... I mean, do, you know, listen to a proper news bulletin. Listen to... It doesn't have to be Radio 4, but it could be Radio 4. You know, listen to a from our own correspondent. Watch Channel 4 News and then compare it to the News at 10 and then compare that to Sky and, and watch a variety of... Take one story... Don't take Brexit because that's too enormous a story. But take one story and then see how that story is covered by different people because, you know, it'll be nuanced and then you will be able to see the the spin that people put on it and the, 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 well, the completely different vantage point that different, different outlets will put on it and, and, and how political pressure is put on in different ways. Um, and, you know, please, you know, if you want to work for something or somebody, understand their output before you launch into the interview room, because it just looks so bad if people say, well, which of our latest productions did you enjoy or which of our latest cover uh, stories did you enjoy? And you, and you like me, oh, I'd never listen to it, you know, help. <laughs> kaleidoscope, yeah. Kaleidoscope, yeah. You can't do that. You have to show... I mean, if any, if, if any, any other... If, if only to flatter the person you're interviewing because, you know, well, who's interviewing you? Because people like it if you've actually heard of what they're producing. Yeah. So, four quick fire questions I'll be asking everyone. So, who or what has been your biggest inspiration throughout your career? The City of Hull. City of Hull, brilliant. And it has been my inspiration because it, 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 its profile was so low and its position was so... People mocked it and, and were rude about it and, and they're not anymore. And I, and I, and I have been... I played a small part in that and it, it has inspired me. Brilliant. I've definitely noticed the change as I've come through. So, um, Good for you. <laughs> and um, how much do you feel your personal brand has played a role in your career? So you being Rosie Mallard, how much has that played a role in where you've got to today? Um, I think... Um, uh, that is a good question. I, I, think, I think that brand is useful to have. Um, and I think uh, if you... If you are constant in your approach to things, you know, like I have been a constant advocate of, I don't know, subsidised arts or, or 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 the arts, as it, so people know what they're getting if they interview me. I think that I think that if you have nothing to say and just rely on your brand, that is a bit weary because then you've really got nothing underneath it when people say, okay, we understand the brand, we get it, we get the the, the shtick and the blonde hair and the short skirt and what have you, but actually, do you have anything to say? And if you find, mm, I don't, then that's a bit... So, and and actually, in terms of Hull City of Culture, um, the brand was Hull, and the, the, and the glory was for the city, um, and we all understood that and wanted it in the team. Um, could you give us one tip, trick, nugget of info about your um, industry that everyone could use in day to day life? Um, turn up. Um, you know, 
90% of success is turning up. And, and what I mean, what I mean by that is if someone says to you, come to this exhibition, come to this event, come to this thing, it, you may be interested in it. Just turn up, you know? Who knows what might happen? Who knows what might happen? Who knows who you'll meet? You might meet someone who will, who, who, who you later realize will change your life, you know? And so, so by that, I mean, be open. And, and be open to new challenges and, and, and adventures. And final question, if someone is looking to get into a similar career to you, um, what would your advice be to them? Um, don't worry if, you're, uh, if you're, your first choice uh, is denied you. Don't go off in a half and think, well, I'm never going to do it. It's like when that man shafted me on kaleidoscope, I didn't think, oh, I'm just going to bury my head in, in my pillow and that's it. I thought, no, you know, right, I'm going to pitch it to someone else. And one of the greatest joys as a freelance is if you write a piece, write an article for somebody who pays you a lot of money and then says, sorry, we can't run this piece. You then sell the same piece to someone else and you just have a, it's a small and personal pleasure and thinking, yay, they're going to see it and they're going to know that, um, yeah, they turned it down. So, you know, do not be dismayed. I mean, I think that disappointment is something which you have to, you have to get a handle of and don't take it personally. Well, thank you very much. I think people will be inspired by the synthesis. So thank you for your time. Well, just... thank you for inviting me. It's a real uh, thank you. It's a huge pleasure. Just quickly, if people want to follow you on social media, oh, how yeah. do they do that? What's well, your tag? <laughs> uh, Twitter, I'm rather unoriginally at Rosie Millard. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it, the last interview in this set of episodes of the My Journey podcast. I'd like to say a big thank you to Rosie for giving up her time to speak to me. It was great to hear her story. Also, as this is the last episode for a short while, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone involved so far. I've had a great time making it and hopefully you guys have enjoyed listening too. I know I bang on about this a bit, but please, please pass the pod on to someone new and leave a review. I want to keep speaking to great guests and this will really help. If you want to keep up to date with the pod between now and next time, follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at the MJ Social. Also, make sure to check out previous episodes with Drew Povey, Alex Deakin, Jim Connolly and Nick Rotherham and Guy Smith. Until next time, thanks for listening. (laughs) 